Hi, I'm Joe Weisenthal, and I am here with Sam Bankman-Fried. He is the CEO and founder of the crypto exchange FTX, but he's really got his hands in sort of numerous things, having had an incredible few years in many aspects of the crypto world. So it's a thrill to have him here and get his perspective. Sam, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. You know, there's obviously so much to talk about, but you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is crypto regulation is always one of these things. People in Washington, they talk about it, and it really feels like it's coming to the front burner, and particularly stable coins. So there are many aspects of crypto regulation that could theoretically touch, or regulation that could theoretically touch crypto, but stable coins feels like a very front of mind topic right now. Yeah. You're a user of stable coins, your exchanges trade stable coins. What are you looking for in terms of like a regulatory regime that makes sense for stable coins? Totally, and this is absolutely front of mind. Um, you know, the presidential working group recently released yeah. uh, a memo on it. We've seen you know lawmakers, regulators comment on it. We've gotten questions from regulators around the world on it. And you know, uh, the way I see it, there's sort of one one sort of like biggest piece of stablecoin regulation, which is missing today, and I think it is going to become really important, uh, which is basically ensuring that you know it's backed the way that it says it is. And I right. uh, you know I think you could design a sort of registration and transparency based regime where you know basically stablecoin issuers have to give daily attestations to exactly what is backing their stablecoin. Um, there have to be, you know, I don't know, audits every six months or whatever, uh, you know, to confirm that it is in fact what they say it is, and you know, some guidelines around what those things can be. And I don't know exactly where you draw the line from, like dollars in U.S. bank account to treasuries, to like grade A plus U.S. corporate paper. Like, there's a spectrum here. I think it's almost less important exactly where you draw the line than like drawing it somewhere, being explicit about that. Um, to make sure it doesn't slide too far down into the really risky category. Maybe you have haircutting on, you know, grade A plus corporate paper, you know, 10% haircut or whatever. So you need to be right. over collateralized there. Um, and so I may have frozen there. I, maybe you could hear me. So your sense right now is that this clarity is uh, is lacking in terms of like, in terms of what's needed? Yeah. Yeah, Let's, uh, I think that's you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pivot a little bit on another stable coins related question. Yeah. What about just the ability to track how they're used? And of course, this has been from crypto from day one. This has been a source of anxiety. And of course, you know, even before stable coins, there was something called the Liberty Reserve and this idea that like, well, you can't just like hold a dollar in a bank and then give someone a token representing it and then let them do whatever they want because, you know, the government sort of likes to know that people aren't engaging in you know, international drug dealing or terrorist finance or things like that. These have been right. sources of anxiety for crypto probably since like crypto was invented. Is that, does there need to be anything further done on the stable coins from that perspective? So I think that there could be sort of a, at least a codification of, you know, what we're seeing right now. But I, I do think that frankly, there's already a lot being done on that front, on the money transmitting front. Um, that's sort of been the case where it's been, if anything, clearest how global regulations apply to the cryptocurrency industry. You know, what we have to mm. say, first of all, uh, you know, you need to be, uh, you know, fully KYC'd in order to create or redeem a stable coin. And so the ultimate, right. you know, issuance and redemption of these are. Um, and then the issuers generally have the ability to blacklist addresses um, on the blockchain that are known to be associated with financial crime. Um, and, you know, this has happened from time to time. Um, and that that is sort of the core of the approach that's going on today, combined with if you're using a stable coin on a centralized platform on, uh, you know, FTX or any other centralized exchange, right, you're going to need to go through that exchange's KYC process as well. And so that that sort of is the, the core of what's being done. But obviously, on top of that, whenever you have a public ledger, um, you know, which you have with, with all major blockchains, it actually provides a pretty powerful tool for right. tracking and combating financial crimes because you know when when you know where someone started with some pool of assets you can trace through exactly how those flow 
through the whole crypto and economic system by looking at, you know, address to address where the coins move and, you know, contacting any centralized sort of organizations in that. So patching those together, is, there's already a pretty decent network of anti-money laundering type of controls. I want to ask one more stable coins question. I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, front of mind here, there was just a federal government uh, paper that was released on stable coin re regulation. But you're, you know, FTX operates all over the world, uh, including yep. in many uh, emerging markets. And historically, uh, you know, a lot of emerging markets, particularly not fully open ones, have attempted to limit um, the ability of people to get dollar denominated assets. And people might want dollarized yep. assets. And yet that might be something that, you know, is limited or banks only allow so much. Could stable coins, the fact that I could send you a stable coin just from my phone to your phone anywhere in the world regardless, it, do are some of the other markets that you operate in, does that is that a source of anxiety for them? It absolutely is. And I think there's sort of a, you know, a few ways to look at this. One, from sort of a U.S. strategic point of view, thinking about what is the reserve currency of the crypto economy going to be? Yeah. And right now, it's unambiguously the U.S. dollar. And interestingly, right. it's the U.S. dollar whether or not you're looking at American crypto economy. If you look at European crypto transactions, Asian crypto transactions, Latin American, African, no matter where you look, there's the local on-ramps where people figure out how to get from their local currency into crypto. But once they're in crypto, they're going yeah. back and forth between Bitcoin and US dollar stable coins. So right now, you know, 95% of transactions are happening against, you know, a US dollar or US dollar paid asset. And I think that that's probably good for the U.S. strategically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there's serious risk if there uh, if, you know, regulations on stablecoin become unworkable in the future um, that while everyone is pretty happy right now with 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 that, um, that, you know, that could change to a different currency. Maybe it changes to euro or yen or maybe it changes to RMB. Um, so that that's sort of one side. When you look at it from the local government's perspective. What we found is what they care about the most is the step where the user goes from their local currency to something that isn't their local currency. And so when right. a user is going back and forth between Bitcoin and USDC or Bitcoin and Tether, the local governments don't tend to care very much because right. it's already not in their local currency. Like to the extent that there is something they're trying sure. to combat, that already happened. And frankly, when someone's sure. going between US dollars and USD stablecoin, they don't care that much right. because again, that's already happened. But the case to where you often do see a lot of regulation is around going from local currency to non-local currency. Each country handles that differently. But you know, in China, we've seen a lot of crackdowns on the RMB-based crypto markets. In Korea, basically only Koreans can access the KRW to cryptocurrency um, you know, markets. And, and, and right. you see patterns like that in a lot of different countries where there clearly is some concern from them about this being used as a vehicle uh, to, uh, you know, move money out of their economic control. Let's pivot to some of the market developments that we're seeing in crypto. You are, I think, as of announced this morning, backing a new fund for Web 3.0 gaming. And this is a hot area and the idea that, OK, with a crypto blockchain uh, platforms, there could be done more than just trading and speculation. And we've seen that take off in a fairly big way over the last, uh, you know, six months, maybe. There's a game called Axie that's really popular. It's still not clear to me with some of these games whether they're fun to play or whether people just play them because they can click their mouse and a few keys and over time make money. Right now, like, what do you see as the state of crypto gaming and what do you see as the potential for why it could be an improvement on sort of like mainstream games that are, exist on a uh, corporate server? Totally. And the first thing I say is I think you're going to see a really big difference between crypto companies trying to make a game and gaming companies trying to introduce crypto. Um, huh. You know, I think that, frankly, it's really hard to make a really engaging video game. Um, I don't think I could do it, right? I mean, it would take a long time to build up that expertise. And so when you hear um, about, a, you know, a top tier gaming publisher looking to introduce crypto into their system, I'm pretty bullish on that. When you look at the opposite direction, I think my re reaction hmm. is like, well, why do we think this team that's sort of like a crypto team is going to be able to build a great video game? 
Um, Interesting. And and I think that that's sort of some of the skepticism that that at least I'm going to have towards the crypto gaming that's coming not from the gaming industry. But what I think I'm really excited about is you take a top tier gaming studio that's making a great game and wants to have market mechanics in it, wants to have real user ownership of the digital assets in it. Um, yeah. And wants to use you know blockchain uh, technology and payment rails and NFTs to enable that. That is where I would guess you're going to see the biggest adoption early on. That's su- that's super interesting. Go, go into that a little further, because actually that wasn't the answer that I was expecting. But I I do find that fascinating because it feels like by and large, legacy companies. You know, they often put out for years now, put out, you know, they'll put out some press release about uh, oh, yeah. crypto and it feels a little bit ham fisted often. They don't really know how to do it. But your sense is that the bets that you want to place, or at least many of them, will be more on this side of, OK, here is a publisher of a very popular game. Maybe it's a massively multiplayer game, et cetera. And crypto can add something to that. What do you see crypto potentially adding that they'll want to be attracted to? Other Absolutely. than a pop of the stock price after they re- after the press release, <laughs> right, right. Um, why would they actually bother to follow through on the the yeah. integration? Um, so first of all, uh, markets can be extremely engaging. Um, you know, we see that all over right. the place, and uh, adding markets to a game, I uh, can 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 really you know help make the game more engaging for users. Um, many games already have economies built into them, but they're extremely illiquid. Um, because it's just like some random video game trying to build an economy out of nothing. But if you get access to an integrated financial system that even people who aren't playing the game can get access to outside of the game as well, that can create a much more liquid marketplace. And hmm. you've seen a lot of you know MMORPGs build. You know, Eve Online is an example of this. Um, yep. You know, I mean, you look at the uh, at World of Warcraft has had this. Um, and many games have miniature versions of this. So building out really liquid, exciting marketplaces in-game is one part of it. Making payments easy is another piece of this. Um, and then a third is creating real social identity around in-game uh, ownership and, um, and, and, and sort of uh, you know, accomplishments where you have NFTs representing skins that you've you know, bought or, or won, NFTs representing your performance in the game. You have a gallery that can be displayed in and out of games. You can tweet out your profile from a game. Um, you can have interaction based on your profiles and really bring straight to the user in a real direct ownership sense and interactable sense um, uh, a representation of who they are online. Um, it is sort of like I think the other piece of this that has a ton of potential. And, and to get to your point of will people actually do this, I think yes. I don't know when, but I can say that almost every major game studio is extremely actively actually looking into doing something tech-wise here. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow. These are It's going to be yeah. a slow trickle uh, at the beginning, but I think almost all of them have decided that they will eventually take the plunge somehow, some way. I feel like if we were having this conversation like six months ago, maybe we would have talked about DeFi or something before you brought up NFTs. Do you feel like ultimately like NFTs is the thing? And I know that's very broad and some people just associate them with like either really expensive art or weird uh, profile characters. Defined broadly is the thing that sort of brings crypto to something resembling like a mass adoption that goes beyond just pure trading. I, I would have given very low probability to that a year ago. Now I would give decent probability to that. I don't want to confidently say that will happen because I think it could be payment rails instead. I, I think that there's a few things sure. it could be, but I would now put NFTs in that top category probability-wise, along with a couple other things in terms of what brings a non-crypto native audience to crypto for something other than financial investing. Um, where you know whether it's integrating with video games, whether it's ticketing for venues or uh, or events or um, or teams. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we're seeing really active movements on those fronts, right. and I think it makes a ton of sense as a product. And it's sort of a pretty clean innovation layer to add on top of the existing structures. Let's talk about uh, your growth plans, and I'm particularly interested in the U.S. market right now because. There is a lot happening, and people in crypto like to complain about U.S. regulations, but when I look at the market overall, I just see more and more happening, and now there's a Bitcoin futures ETF, which maybe a few years ago might have seemed uh, unimaginable. 
FTX US, one of your uh, uh, subdivisions, what is what do you see as the opportunity in the US uh, market for that for that asset? Yeah, massive. And, you know, the United States generally has the deepest, the most liquid and the highest volume markets in the world. Um, this is true in almost every asset class. It's also true in almost every asset class that more than half of the volume trades through derivatives and futures. Um, this is not a crypto right. specific phenomenon. This is, you know, name name your favorite sector, most of the volumes going up in futures. Um, I, but uh, in the United States right now, crypto is an exception to that. So you look at global crypto right. volume, right? And, and I, I can even just like pull up numbers here from 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 you know from today. On, on what does you know the sort of global crypto volume distribution look like, and it just looks really different internationally than it does in the United States, where you know we see 170 billion dollars of volume trading in the last day globally. It's a lot of volume, first of all. That's the same order of magnitude as United States stocks do. Um, but uh, what's the breakdown of that internationally? We see it as uh, you know more derivatives than spot. You know, in general, we'll often right. see two to one derivative to spot volume. In the United States today, um, there has been $1.7 billion of futures volume. Um, it's, you know, 10% of the U.S. volume and 1% of the global volume are U.S. futures. You would expect that to be the biggest source of global volume. Right. And what's going on is almost all the volume goes through crypto native players and none of them have licensing. Um, right. For at least some of the big ones do for futures in the United States. Um, I think that's the biggest missing liquidity source in crypto. I think that markets could be substantially more efficient, substantially more regulated, substantially more liquid were that there. And, you know, we would love to enter that space and, you know, are working. So, so what has so to happen? Because right, right now there are people in the United States that uh, would love to trade perpetual futures on FTX.com and right. they look at what's on FTX.us and it's not there. And obviously, uh, you know, there are all kinds of more interesting things that happen on the non-US side. What's blocking that? Who specifically and who do you have, who has to give the green light in the US? Is it have to be on the legislative side or is it a regulatory side where it's like, okay, this is something that more retail focused exchanges can start, uh, who gives that green light? It's a CFTC. And um, this is actually within the scope of traditional CFTC licenses. Um, there are potentially things that can be offered to a wide variety of users. Um, and they're pretty broad in terms of what products, both in terms of the, the, the structure of the product and the underlying, um, that, that, that you, know, you could offer futures or derivatives on. Uh, we have a subsidiary FTX US Derivatives, which has uh, licensing for this, which has a DCO and a DCM. Um, and an SCF, actually. Um, and, you know, we're actively engaging with the CFTC, discussing the products that we would be excited to launch, um, you know, talking through those. And, you know, we're optimistic that we're going to be able to uh, really launch some exciting products in that area, you know, over the next year or two. And um, I think very little is completely outside the scope of what that license could right. theoretically do. It's all, uh, it's all just a question of what we in the CFTC and, and you know, particularly the CFTC ultimately feels comfortable with. And, you know, it's, it's probably going to be an area of process. But, um, I, but no, there doesn't need to be legislative changes for uh, crypto futures in the United States. That's something that, that can already exist with licensing. All right, Sam, we have just a, less than a minute to go. So real quickly, you know, we sort of think of these two things as dual tracks. What about uh, cryptoified or tokenized traditional markets? What is the hurdle before we really were to see, like, say, people, companies issuing stock or tokenized versions of stock futures or treasury futures running on crypto rails? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think the big question that I'd ask is who would list that product? What exchange would? Yeah. Are you looking for FTX or Coinbase to list it? Are you looking for the New York Stock Exchange to list it? Are you looking for some third type of platform to list it? Is Robinhood going to be able to? That's honestly the biggest question is what licensing would one need to offer such a product? Would it be offered on crypto rails or traditional clearing rails? And I don't know what's going to happen there, but you know, that's going to be a discussion with the SEC. Right. And I think you know, you've heard Chair Gensler say, you know, again and again, look, we would love to see crypto platforms come in and register. Um if I had to guess, I would guess that you know he and the SEC have been thinking about 
what the, a regime like that might look like. Um, I would yeah. not be surprised to see developments over the next year on that. Sam Bankman-Fried, CEO and founder of FTX, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.